We're beginning chapter three now, and chapter three is so important. It is essentially applications of derivatives. So we haven't done much in the way of applications yet. So in this chapter, we are going to explore how derivatives can be helpful when we are looking at the behavior of a function. This very first video has to do with relative and absolute extrema. In calculus, we often want to determine the behavior of a function, and we want to do that without having to break out our graphing calculator. The reason for that is there are some real life applications that go along with the behavior of a function. For instance, when we're asking, does the function have a minimum, that can help us to determine a minimum cost or a minimum amount of material that must be used. Does it have a maximum? How can I maximize the volume or maximize my profit and so forth? So our study of derivatives, which is what we've been studying in our last chapter, will come into play. Um, but this video is not about finding the extrema, the minimum or maximum. We're learning about that process in our next video. Right now, we want to talk about terminology associated with extrema. So when you're asked to find something, you know what you're being asked to find. We're going to start by looking at absolute extrema. Some textbooks call it global extrema, but we're going to stick with absolute. So f of c is the absolute minimum of f on an interval, which is closed, a closed interval a, b when f of c is less than f of x for all x's in the interval. So a couple of things to point out. f of c is referring to the y value, and it's the absolute minimum on a closed interval when f of c is less than or equal to f of x. And this, in case you haven't seen that before, means for all. So essentially we're just saying, if the y value is less than the y value of any other point on our function, it's our absolute minimum. Same thing for absolute max. If the y value is greater than the y value for every other function or every other value on our function, then it is the absolute maximum. So before we talk about the extreme value theorem, let's take a look at my pictures um, because I want to talk about not only what is the min and max, um, but also how continuity comes into play. So let's take a look at my first picture. My first picture is on the closed interval, negative one, two. So this is a closed interval. I know it's closed because these circles are filled in. So that's a closed interval. What is the absolute min and absolute max? Well, if I'm looking at the picture, I can see very clearly that one would be my absolute minimum. One is the y value. So again, we're looking at the y value. One is the y value that is less than everything else. Now, a lot of students say the absolute min is zero, one, which seems correct, but it's actually incorrect. The absolute minimum is the y value. So quite often you will say, the absolute minimum is one and it occurs at zero comma one. So it just gives us the location, but one is the minimum. What is the absolute maximum? Again, just by looking at the picture, I can see that five is the absolute maximum. Now I do have another end point over here, but notice it's neither the greatest nor the least. So two falls between five and one. So that one doesn't really do anything for us. Now let's look at my second picture. Obviously this is the same picture, but this is an open interval from negative one to two. Now an open interval is much different because I can see that there is no point at two five and there is no point at negative one two. Those actually do not exist on my function. So that means, do I have an absolute max? No absolute max. Now you might be saying, well, what about, you know, this point right here before two five? And the answer is I can always get increasingly close to two five. I can always get a little bit closer to two five without actually touching two five because two five is not on our function. So I can't use that. However, this value is still 
the absolute min. Again, because that circle is closed in, it's part of my function. For the last one, we are back to a closed interval, negative 1, 2, which means I can still use 5 as my absolute max. But now, if you'll notice, this is not a continuous function. It's not continuous because there's a break in the graph at 0, 1, and obviously it's been redefined as 0, 2. So I can't use 0, 2 for anything, and I can't use 0, 1 for anything because it's not part of my function. So this is no absolute min. Now quickly let's talk about the extreme value theorem, and this is pretty straightforward. This says if you have a continuous function on a closed interval, so think about this picture right here, then f has both a minimum and a maximum on the interval. And that makes perfect sense. If I'm connecting these two points, it doesn't matter how I connect them, there's always going to be a min and a max because I have a closed interval. Now keep in mind it has to be closed and it has to be continuous. So that's why this one didn't work and that's why this one didn't work because this was open and this was not continuous. We just talked about absolute extrema. Now we want to talk about relative extrema, um, also called local extrema. So f of c is a relative minimum of f if there exists an open interval containing c on which f of c is a minimum, and then same thing for a maximum. So here's what I mean by that. Looking at my first picture, I can see that negative 2 is not the absolute minimum because this continues on forever in the negative direction. So obviously any value down here is less than negative 2. However, in the interval from negative 1 to 2, it's very clear that within that interval, the minimum is negative 2. Now, keep in mind, you don't have to define the interval. You're basically just saying, look, compared to the values around it, negative 2 is the minimum. Compared to the values around it, positive 2 is a maximum. So they're not absolutes, they're just relative, relative to the values around them. So 2 would be my relative max, and negative 2 would be my relative min. Now what's happening on the next picture? Notice it's the same picture, um, but I've stopped the graph here at each endpoint at negative 2, negative 2, and positive 2, positive 2. Well, now what do I have? Well, it's a closed interval now, so I can have absolute min and absolute max. Now, again, this is where people get confused because they think, well, hold on. Does that mean the absolute min is at negative 2, negative 2, and at 1, negative 2? And the answer is no. Remember, we're talking about the y value. So the absolute min is that f of c is equal to negative 2, right? So the y value is negative 2. Now, where does it occur? Well, it occurs at both negative 2 and 1. The absolute max is, again, the greatest y value, which is 2. And then, again, it occurs in two places, but it is the absolute max of 2. So even though this is relative to things around it, this would still be considered an absolute max because we're on a closed interval. So just a quick observation because it's going to come into play in our next video. So notice that on the open interval, a min or a max can only occur on a hill or a valley. So I've got a hill here, I've got a max. I've got a valley here, I've got a min. And again, it's relative. So what would the tangent line look like at that point? Well, if I drew a tangent line here, it makes sense that it would have a horizontal tangent line. And same thing here. Well, what's the slope of a horizontal line? The slope of a horizontal line is zero. So that is going to come into play. Then also notice that on a closed interval, we can have 
relative or absolute mins or maxes at the same places, but also that it occur at an endpoint. So again, all of this is going to come into play when we are asked to find relative or absolute extrema in our next video. Up next, we're actually going to find the extrema. So it is finding critical numbers and extrema.